And what is up, everybody? Thank you so much for tuning in tonight. Be sure to hit that subscribe button so you don't miss any of the content I put out every single week. It is time to talk Mbappe and League's Cup. Haven't had any conversation about everything going on with Kylian Mbappe yet. Wanted to make sure World Cup got the attention it deserved in terms of a preview last week. And there wasn't all that much to really discuss in terms of news with Mbappe. That has obviously changed over the past week. And so today is the perfect day to really dive into this. It is such a strange situation. And the question I keep coming back to is what does Kylian Mbappe expect PSG to do? What did he think was going to happen when he informed them he wasn't going to extend his contract? And I, I don't necess- I don't particularly want to defend PSG, but in this case, I I get it. Now, part of this is that PSG gave Mbappe so much power and so much leverage that he is in control. The only thing PSG can do is what PSG appear willing to do, which is to freeze him out and try and convince him not to stay for the rest of his contract. And then the next dynamic to this is there's a good article in The Athletic about the legal ramifications of this if it continues into the season. Basically, French labor law, you can do whatever you want as a club, during the transfer window. But after the transfer window ends, it's a different situation in terms of the legality of just not playing players. And PSG have gotten in trouble for this before. Now, it's it's not cut and dry in terms of it is clearly illegal. But if they go through with this, and Mbappe is a member of this team and not playing, when the window closes, they're opening themselves up to a lawsuit and more headaches. And at that point, whether they win the lawsuit or not is, you know, only half the story because it's about the the frustration, the tension, the distraction, all of that kind of stuff. But from, from Mbappe's perspective, PSG have to do everything in their power to not let him leave for free. He is the most valuable asset in the sport. And I don't like talking about people as assets. But you get what I'm I'm saying there. They were never just going to go, okay, that's fine. We'll take you for another season, then you can go to Real Madrid. And what I am so confused about is that there's a solution here that Mbappe doesn't seem interested in. And that's to get some kind of contract extension so that he retains his value and then there is an understanding that he goes to Real Madrid next summer. Because he seems, at least originally, when he put this, when he made this decision not to extend his contract, very content to play at PSG this season with his contract winding down. Which is the part of this I don't get. Because PSG were never just going to accept that. So what did he want PSG to do? And now the other possibility that got thrown around was... You go to Saudi Arabia for a year. The total price tag was over a billion between the transfer fee and Mbappe's salary. Seems like that, according to Fabrizio Romano, that's a no-go. That never seemed realistic to me in terms of Mbappe wanting to do that. 
So your two options are either sign an extension so that your value is retained because it seems like PSG have just accepted he's leaving. So there's not going to be any roadblocks to getting a deal with Real Madrid done next summer. Or convince Real Madrid to come to the table now so that this gets done. And again, because PSG handed them the keys, all they can do is just say, we're not going to let you play your contract out. So either you're going to sign another one so that we can make this deal with Real Madrid next summer, or you're going to get Real Madrid to come to the table now, or you're not going to play. Because that's the only piece of leverage they have. And who knows how it ends. And it seems there was reports out there that Mbappe was content to just sit on the bench. Now, going into a Euros and an Olympics, interesting conversation for another day. But that's the part of this that baffles me, is that it just seems like Mbappe is not taking into consideration PSG's viewpoint on this and PSG's perspective. Because it's one thing if PSG were just saying, no, you can't leave. This is almost the opposite. It's, <laughs> you need to leave if you're going to leave. Because again, the, the one thing PSG have to do everything in their power to avoid is him walking out the door for free. And he just seems unwilling to make that happen, which appears to be part of the reason PSG is so frustrated with him. And uh, you know, I've been reading things that are basically saying they feel like he's betrayed them by not working with them to make sure that they get the transfer fee for him. And again, I, I'm not a huge fan of just agreeing with PSG, but I get it. I would just love to hear from Mbappe. What, what does he want out of this? Because he holds all the cards. If he wants to go to Real Madrid, then there are two options. You convince Real Madrid to get you now, or you work with PSG to set it up for next summer. And neither of those seem particularly close to happening at this moment. And so... I would be doing the exact same thing if I was PSG. You got to use what you have to try and force his hand. But you can't force him to do anything, especially if he's willing to sit on the bench. And especially if it's going to lead to a lawsuit. Because you put all of your chips into the Kylian Mbappe basket. And... I probably would have done the same thing too. Because yet you had to take the chance. But at the at the at the same time, you know, six six months after he signed that contract. The Real Madrid rumors and unhappiness started, you know, the reports about him being unhappy all started again. And it's Mbappe, you got to try. You know, I, 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 it's not that I think PSG made a mistake in the way they went about this. And they have gotten to the point where they realized that you can't take that, that risk again of potentially letting him walk for free. If he can't commit to you, you got to move on and get what you can for him. And I, I, I'm just confused as to why this is so hard to figure out when everybody at this point is kind of accepting and wants the same things. It's not like PSG are refusing to sell. PSG have come to terms with the fact that he is going to Real Madrid. They just want it to be done in a way that benefits them. 
or they're going to do what they can to try and make that happen. And it ultimately, they went, they, you know, they gave him everything they possibly could to try and keep him and it worked. And now you're paying the price for that because he has all of the leverage. The only thing they have left is you're not playing on a one-year deal on an expiring contract. We will sit you on the bench. So either figure it out now or you're not playing next season. I, It just doesn't seem like we're close to any kind of solution here. And again, it just baffles me because it. I just don't feel like it should be that hard to figure out. Because everybody's working... Everybody is at least accepting of where this is going to go. And if Mbappe is happy to to run his contract out, he's got to understand that PSG aren't going to let him do that. And maybe he just doesn't care. And it also gets into conversations about his legacy, where this could have... Look, him deciding he wanted to leave France was going to be a hit to his legacy and his reputation in France and, you know, among PSG fans, obviously. But there was a way to do this where everybody was on the same page. And it didn't need to be this tense. PSG gave you the ultimatum, sign a contract, or we're selling. At that point, you make a decision. And if your decision is Real Madrid, you go to Real Madrid, and it's not this messy. But here we are. That's I'm just going in circles at this point. That's the part of this I really want to emphasize, though, is I, I'm just struggling to understand Mbappe's thought process here and what he's actually trying to get out of it. Because it just seems like he won't come out and say, I want to go to Real Madrid. But every indication is that's what he wants. PSG can help him do that. But they're not working together. So we're going to have to wait and see what happens here in the next week or so with this and see how long it drags on. Uh, Who knows what happens next? It just appears he's not going to Saudi Arabia. That's the, the one tangible development we've gotten so far in this. Also want to take a few moments to check in on what's happening with League's Cup. Of course, the big story, what Lionel Messi is doing for Inter-Miami. Two games, goals, assists, two wins for Inter-Miami. Couldn't have asked for a better start. He, of course, has the magical late-game winner. Then they trounce Atlanta United. And that was an Atlanta team with most of your preferred 11 out there. Getting a win like that does mean something. This tournament is strange. Still trying to get a feel for how much people actually care about it. It's going to take time to kind of build a reputation. But this is the the games the teams are playing right now. So you're going to play most of your players. And Atlanta was no exception. It's not like that was a terrible C squad that they put out there. And... Miami ripped him to shreds. I still, before I really get on board with this and completely change how I feel about Inter Miami, because I said this in my weekend roundup and I'll say it here again. To me, what the rest of the season is going to be is a lot of what you saw in that first game. They're obviously much better with them on the field. I still don't think they scare the best teams in MLS. I still think they're going to have defensive struggles. He's going to win them some games and steal some points they don't deserve. But it's not like they're going to turn into this juggernaut overnight. And I still feel that way. For me to change my mind on that, got to see what it looks like on the road consistently over an extended period of time. You know, is Messi playing 60 to 90 minutes every game? And I want to see it during MLS regular season. Because as I said before, we just don't know what this tournament actually means. This is the perfect opportunity for Inter-Miami 
to go on a run. They could absolutely win this tournament. Because when you get into this condensed time frame, and you're talking about basically moving forward here, elimination games, Messi's the kind of guy that can obviously... Messi might be the guy on the planet who can go win you a game out of nothing. It's a different conversation when you're trying to build week after week after week in MLS and catch up from, to everybody. That's what I'm still not convinced they can do. So I want to see them in MLS regular season when you're playing the Cincinnati's of the world, you're playing the Philadelphia's of the world, the you know Columbus's of the world, New England Revolution, the best teams in the Eastern Conference, and you're getting every team's best shot every week. Because once you get back in MLS play, it's the push for the playoffs. And everybody's trying to not only get in, but be in form heading into the playoffs. There's right, there's that kind of acclimation period. The Sounders are the best in the league at this. Sometimes they just don't really get going until, you know, about this time. And then from July onward. Once the summer comes, they start tearing it up and all of a sudden they're one of the most dangerous teams in the league. You don't have that kind of time if you're into Miami. So to me, I'm, I'm very much treating this as two separate performances and situations. I don't see all that much overlap between them. But they just did trounce a good Atlanta team at home. That does mean something, as I mentioned. Still want to see on the road. Still want to see it in the actual MLS regular season environment. But it, <laughs> this is working so far. I'm just, I'm not going to get too excited too quickly. Need to see more consistency before I feel like the team you saw against Atlanta is the team you're going to see every week. Certainly they are capable of those kind of performances. They got to be able to do it week in and week out, though, if they're going to make the playoffs. That's the part I still have a mental hurdle with. Outside of that, just as the tournament overall, it's been very balanced. You haven't seen a huge lean in the direction of League MX or a huge lean in the direction of MLS. You got two teams as I'm recording this, and you know games are now underway Wednesday night. But you got Mazelton. And Inter Miami are your two teams through as group winners. One MLS, one Liga MX. You've got some groups where the Liga MX teams are off to a better start, some where the MLS teams are. It just seems like two very well balanced leagues because that's what they are. You're going to probably see more MLS teams just because of raw numbers making it but proportionally I feel like it's going to be pretty equal and you know it's just hard because some teams have played one game some teams have played two it's we're going to just get a lot a lot of clarity by the time we get to the end of this weekend and I believe the the group stage ends on Monday night if I remember correctly but there there hasn't been a huge oh here comes Liga MX or MLS is destroying Liga MX it's been some for Liga MX, some for MLS. And again, you know, most teams have played one game. I don't know what to... It's one game in this new tournament. I don't know what to make of that yet. And also, I fundamentally don't make a lot of whatever happens in knockout tournaments like this. Because they are inherently unpredictable. So we're just going to have to see how this thing goes. But that is my takeaway so far is it looks like two evenly balanced teams, I mean, two evenly balanced leagues, because that's what you have. The other MLS thing I wanted to mention before I move on, Sam Surridge is in from Nottingham Forest, joining Nashville as a designated player. Nashville has tried <laughs> and failed to identify other designated player strikers that can finally get this team some goals. So this has to actually work before what I'm about to say can happen. But if Sam Sturridge comes in 
and is worth the something like six and a half million dollars they paid for him. Nashville goes from being a really difficult team to play against that is set up for postseason success because of their defensive foundation and the fact they have a match winner in Hani Mukhtar to a top-tier contender to win MLS Cup. I will not pick them to win MLS Cup until somebody else starts scoring goals. Going back to my tournament philosophy, you have to have more than one way to win. And their way to win right now is defense and Hani Mukhtar. That is a better foundation than most teams. Because you do have the guy that can get you the goal and can be the best player on the field. But to be able... So that gives you a chance against anybody. But to go from that to being able to win round after round after round and to adjust to the different situations that get thrown your way and the unpredictable nature of knockout tournaments, you've got to have a plan B. And that is where Nashville have come up short time and time again. They don't have anything outside of Mukhtar going forward. If Surge is that guy, they're, they are right there with every team in the league. If I'm picking MLS Cup, to me it's a three-horse race in the East between them, Philly, and Cincinnati. And right now, I'm picking Philly and Cincinnati because they have those guys. They have multiple of them. But you throw Surge in the mix, now it's a different conversation. This is the story of LAFC last season. What Steve Sherindola has done that he's not getting enough credit for. They went from being a team that beat you one way that doesn't deal well with chaos, that had this set foundation and approach that was how they were going to play no matter what was happening, to a much more tactically flexible team that can dominate the ball when they need to, that can hit on the counter when they need to, that is still really good defensively, it's just a much more multidimensional team. It's not an accident that they went and won MLS Cup and then nearly won CONCACAF Champions League with a team that I still contend is nowhere near as good relative to the rest of the league as some of those Bob Bradley teams, particularly the, the Supporters Shield one, the Diego Rossi-Carlos Vela combination. I, I'm not blown away by the LAFC talent level. Of course they're a great team. But what has changed is that they are so much more difficult to beat in tournament play. And you're seeing this. They haven't been great over the regular season. But you still want no part of them because they are so well equipped to deal with the chaos now. Nashville's got to be able to get to that point too. It is what is holding them back. Because foundationally, they have the formula to win MLS Cup. There aren't many teams that do. They are one of them. But that that missing piece is the striker. Somebody else to go score you 15 goals in a season. If Sam Surge is that guy, I'm going to be talking about, and he and Mutar are healthy, and they look like Nashville coming into the postseason. To me, they are right there with anybody. You have to count them as one of the favorites, if not the favorites to win MLS Cup. That's, that's how important the signing is, if they get it right. So I wanted to acknowledge that because this there will not be a signing in Major League Soccer that holds more weight. And, and, and by signing, I mean this transfer window, midseason, that holds more weight than this one. This is the difference between being a good team a very good team, I should say. Maybe even a great one. And a championship level team. If Sam Surridge delivers and is what Nashville is paying for him to be.